Sydney, Australia. This Qantas Boeing 747 was on its way to Argentina. On its climb to 32,000 feet, smoke started to fill the cockpit. The flight crew of four people now had to act fast because if the fire was to become established, it is unlikely that the crew will be able to extinguish it. Using the final reports, this video will show you how this happened and what happens next. To find out, stay tuned. On the 15th of November 2010, this Qantas Airlines Boeing 747 was preparing for a long distance flight from Sydney, New South Wales to Buenos Aires in Argentina. On board the aircraft, there were four flight crew, a captain, a first officer, and two second officers. Along with the flight crew, there were 13 cabin crew and 205 passengers. For this flight crew, the flying positions would be the captain and one of the second officers, with the other first officer and second officer in the observer seats. When the crew arrived at the aircraft, the captain and first officer entered the aircraft, whilst the remaining flight crew carried out the war crown of the aircraft. They also checked the maintenance record for the aircraft, and it was noted that the left electronic flight instrument system, or EFIS, the control panel had just been replaced. When they inquired why, it was discovered that on the previous flight from Los Angeles to Sydney, the flight crew reported that the barrow selector was operating intermittently throughout the flight, and as a result, the panel was replaced when the aircraft arrived at Sydney. The barrow selector allows the pilot to select standard barometric settings of either 29.92 inches of mercury or 1013 hectopascals. It also allows them to adjust the barometric reference unit between both inches of mercury and hectopascals or to adjust the barometric reference on the primary flight display. So apart from the EFIS panel replacement, everything else was looking normal and the crew were happy with the aircraft and the route plan. The only other issue was a series of thunderstorms in the local area, but these were isolated and could easily be avoided. If a cell was to enter the aerodrome area, they could just delay the departure until the weather had passed through. All 205 of the passengers now boarded the aircraft with the guidance of the 13 cabin crew. They were all seated and settled in with no issue. With boarding complete, the flight crew now requested engine start and carried out their pre-taxi checks. The weather at Sydney Kingsford Smith Airport was fair. The wind was coming from the south at nine knots there were light showers and broken clouds with some embedded thunderstorms. The visibility was seven kilometers, which was reduced in the heavier rain to about five kilometers, and the temperature was 20 degrees Celsius. The Qantas flight now taxied towards their taxi holding point. During the taxi, the flight crew double checked their performance data and started their pre-takeoff checks. As they reached the taxi holding point, the second officer now briefed the crew on their departure profile and the actions on an emergency. With all the crew content, they informed air traffic control that they were ready for departure and they were immediately cleared for takeoff. As they lined up on the runway, the second officer moved the thrust levers forward and the engine spooled up, started to accelerate the aircraft down the runway. At 11.50 local time, the Qantas flight took off from Sydney airport. Shortly after takeoff, they were cleared all the way up to flight level 320. This equates to 32,000 feet, but not exactly. Just to clear up any confusion, a flight level is an altitude above a specific pressure datum. Because the pressure at sea level fluctuates all the time, a standard pressure setting is used, which is either 1013.2 hectopascals or 29.92 inches of mercury. This ensures that all aircraft can be deconflicted correctly and that there is more structure in the sky as all aircraft are operating at the same altitudes. Aircraft will switch to the standard pressure setting when they pass the transition level. This level can vary depending on the airfield. For Sydney Airport, this is 10,000 feet, whereas in the USA and Canada, it's as a standard set at 18,000 feet. So once they pass that transition level, they will switch to a standard pressure setting and this way all aircraft are operating within the same numbers. So if an aircraft is at flight level 320, this does equate to 32,000 feet for everyone on that pressure setting. But in reality, their actual altitude based on the exact sea level pressure setting will be slightly different 
but ultimately this difference is irrelevant as the local pressure setting and more accurate altitudes are only applicable below a transition level. I hope that clears it up and doesn't make it more confusing. If you do have any questions, just ask in the comments below and I'll get back to you. If I don't, there are many pilots, air traffic controllers and very knowledgeable people that I see down there and they can assist too. So, as the Qantas flight is in the climb, the flight crew have cleaned up the aircraft with the gear up and the flaps at zero. As they're passing through flight level 270 in the climb to flight level 320, the crew start to notice a strong electrical smell in the cockpit. The captain quickly scans the engine indication and crew alerting system, ECAS, and everything appears normal. The first officer and second officer in the observer seats are now trying to figure out where the smell is coming from. Only a few moments later, smoke starts to emanate from the left hand side of the flight deck. The second officer immediately called for the flight crew to don their oxygen masks. At the same time, he switched positions with the first officer and took his place in the observer seat. As the crew were putting on their oxygen masks, it was noticed that the smoke was coming from the left electronic flight instrument system, EFIS, control panel. With smoke and fumes continuing to fill the flight deck, the captain took control of the aircraft. He was fully aware that fire in the air is one of the most hazardous situations that an aircraft crew can be faced with. Without aggressive intervention, a fire on board an aircraft can lead to a catastrophic loss of the aircraft within a very short period of time. Once a fire has become established, it is unlikely that the crew will be able to extinguish it. With this in mind, they needed to act fast. He leveled the aircraft and informed air traffic control that they were having issues, but would update them when they had more information. At the same time, the flight crew carried out the checklist for in-flight smoke, fire and fumes in the cockpit. They had already carried out the initial steps of the checklist, which was to get their oxygen masks on and to ensure good communication through the microphones in the mask. The oxygen masks and microphones would have been checked before takeoff to ensure they were working correctly. At this point they then needed to establish the exact location of the smoke and isolate the electrical power. They had already realised the smoke was coming from the left EFIS control panel, so checked the circuit breakers and saw that the circuit breaker had already been tripped. At this point, the ECAS was displaying the message EFIS Control L. With the electrical supply halted to the affected unit, the smoke appeared to slow down. One of the second officers got in touch with the cabin crew and confirmed that the issue was only occurring within the flight deck and the cabin was smoke and fume free. The crew now discussed their next move. There was a unanimous agreement to return to Sydney Airport. Although the source of the smoke seemed to have stopped, the source was still unknown and posed a threat to everyone on board as there was still a risk of it starting again. The captain now started to prepare for a return to Sydney Airport and briefed the crew on their anticipated approach and actions beforehand. An immediate return would mean that they would land above their maximum landing weight. They understood the requirement to land as soon as possible but the risk of further complications with an overweight aircraft could be reduced whilst the smoke was at bay. They decided that they would need to dump fuel before attempting a landing. As the smoke was now dissipating, the captain requested that the two non-flying pilots lift their oxygen masks and assess the quality of the air. Both second officers lifted their masks and reported that the fumes were still present and were very strong. The decision was made to keep the masks on as the risk of hypoxia or incapacitation due to the fumes was still very high. Shortly after this, the first officer lost communication with the rest of the flight deck. His oxygen mask microphone had stopped working. One of the second officers assisted and rechecked all the fittings, but nothing had become detached. They would now have to resort to using hand signals to assist with communication. Due to the increased workload, the captain reassigned duties among the flight crew. With one of the second officers tasked with maintaining communications with the cabin crew, passengers and the aircraft operator. The first officer's microphone now started to work, albeit intermittently. The cabin crew were now briefed of the plan to return to Sydney airport and subsequently the passengers were informed. The first officer now puts in a pan call to air traffic control. So the pan call is considered a step below the mayday call but still signifies an urgent situation. 
It is used to communicate an important issue that requires immediate attention, but does not pose an immediate threat to life or the safety of the aircraft. They were informed by air traffic control that the rescue and firefighting services were now on standby. On their return to Sydney Airport, they initiated the fuel dump and commenced the descent to 10,000 feet. When they checked on the updated weather through the ATIS, which stands for Automatic Terminal Information Service, the weather was the same as when they had left, with isolated thunderstorms still in the area. They were happy to continue with their approach, but they requested that air traffic control inform them of any significant changes due to the passing weather system. During the descent, the first officers again assessed the air quality of the cockpit and determined that the fumes had stabilised. Even still, they opted to remain on oxygen, even with the increased difficulty in communicating effectively. The first officer now requested to hold in close proximity to Sydney Airport, whilst they continue to dump fuel and reduce their weight. Sydney Air Traffic Control obliged and cleared them to descend to 7,000 feet but instructed them to enter a holding pattern further away than requested to keep them clear of the weather system that was still passing through. The crew now cleared up their final checks for their approach, and with the failure of the left EFIS, one of the second officers was assigned to monitor the aircraft's standby instruments for the approach. The crew were now prompted to expedite their approach and land in, as they received a crew oxy low ECAS message. This meant they were running low on the oxygen being supplied to their masks. The fuel dump was not yet complete, and the captain checked the fuel status and determined that they were now at their maximum landing weight so they could land safely. They would have preferred to have lost a bit more weight, but with the risk of running out of oxygen and having no safety system in place if the smoke started to fill the cockpit again, the decision was made to request an immediate approach. The Qantas Boeing 747 then carried out an approach, landing at 1320 with no issues. Whilst carrying out their after landing checks, the captain was unable to turn off his weather radar due to the EFIS failure. This needed to be switched off so that it didn't radiate ground personnel near the front of the aircraft. The crew then pulled the circuit breaker, turning off the weather radar, and the aircraft taxied back to the terminal. The aircraft was shut down and the rescue and firefighting services personnel checked the aircraft and deemed it safe, with the passengers deboarding the aircraft normally. Following this incident, the left EFIS control panel was removed by the operator's engineering personnel, and a strong burning smell was observed. The electrical connector for the panel was inspected, with no evidence of overheating, bent contacts, or mechanical damage found. The panel was replaced and tested serviceable. The actual cause of the smoke and fumes was not determined, but after the panel was replaced, the aircraft did not have the same issue again. So it's safe to say that the issue was caused by the faulty panel or the installation process. This was another example of where the flight crew remained calm and kept professional, leading to a very positive result. They stayed within the procedures, which would have only helped the two second officers who didn't have a wealth of experience to fall back on. I hope you found this incident interesting and are enjoying the content. I have a playlist with all my other air crash investigation or air accident investigation videos for you to check out if you want to see more. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.